We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think uh, we have to start. Welcome to uh, the IGF Open Forum 57, uh, co-organized by the Council of Europe and UNESCO on the role of regulation in a post-pandemic context. My name is Peter Kimpian and I will be the moderator for uh, this open forum. We have uh, five excellent speakers uh, today uh, who will present their views on the issues um, at stake. And we will give uh, now the floor to the audience uh, and, and reply to questions you might put in the chat or ask for the floor uh, during the Q&A. But what is really at stake uh, here? Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic prompted many governments and non-state actors to use new emerging technologies in their battle to find solutions to curb propagation of the virus. Several dig digital tools, as you all may know, have emerged as part of national efforts to limit infections, like mobile applications enabling to trace the contamination, chain self-diagnosis, etc. In light of the recent developments, these digital, these digital tools now focus on two main areas, setting up system enabling to store and provide health-related data on COVID-19 and creating information systems for organization and monitoring of vaccination campaigns. But many questions around these new tools and the new systems uh, have, ar have arisen, such as the regulation would be enough to prevent harm or unnecessary or proportionate interference with human rights of individuals Why deploying uh, those systems have the new reg regulation restricting limiting human rights often for better efficiency of new processing technologies will become the norm. Our current enforcement and redress avenues can take up the challenges and ensure human rights can be fully exercised and if restricted, that it complies with international standards. So these are the questions we have asked ourselves in advance and the panelists will give their views on that. And I have the pleasure to give the floor first to Patrick Pennings from the Council of Europe, who will give uh, his position, his insight uh, on these important questions. Patrick, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Peter. I hope uh, all is fine. Um, good morning or good late night for some participants uh, around the globe, I would say. Um, thank you for inviting me to this panel. And let me just uh, start by um, saying a few words. Before I start, Peter, I would like to tell the audience as well that um, um, and, and it replies very much to the question of uh, regulation, not only in a post-pandemic context, but also more globally, the choice of the organization for regulation. Because last week, just a week ago, the committee, uh, Intergovernmental Expert Committee on Artificial Intelligence, the CAHAI, adopted a document on possible elements of a legal framework on artificial intelligence based on the Council of Europe standards on human rights, democracy and rule of law. You will immediately see that this already answers some of the questions that the audience may have. We know that the pandemic has been the reason invoked by a number of countries to temporarily suspend some provisions of the European Convention on Human Rights and hence uh, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe published several guidance notes already uh, um, in April 2020 and later as well in relation to the global crisis cause, caused by COVID-19 in order to prevent that extraordinary measures often underpinned by digital technology be used for unlawful purposes and control of the population or specific groups of the population, such as journalists. 
In addition to these guidance notes, the Secretary General also took uh, individual actions in relation to certain member states that were not in full compliance with the standards established by the European Court of Human Rights or by the over 200 conventions when putting in place the implementing extraordinary measures to curb the propagation of the virus. The Committee of Ministers has emphasized several times the need to ensure that human rights and fundamental freedoms apply equally offline and online. Therefore, the principles and rules of the Council of Europe Convention for the Protection of Individuals with regard to the automatic or automated processing of personal data, more commonly known to all of you as Convention 108, should apply in an online environment and during crisis as well. We had learned from previous experiences that during times of crisis, governments sometimes tend to, in, to support some measures which are not necessarily in full compliance with their commitments at an international level. The, this convention uh, now, the Convention 108, stretches out already to three regions of the world, has already 55 parties and more than 30 observers and remains the only legally binding multilateral instrument on the protection of privacy and personal data. Amongst the principles and the provisions, the necessity, proportionality, purpose limitation, appropriate legal basis, etc., are applicable since the 80s and some of the new provisions that are to be found in its modernized version, such as increased transparency, meaningful accountability, new generation of data protection rights, enhanced data security, and strong oversight authorities are becoming increasingly important in the current pandemic context. You can imagine so. It becomes even more relevant for COVID-19 related exception measures as its Article 11 creates a unique democratic framework which makes all provisions and rights of the Convention fully compatible with other important interests such as public safety and security which are also keen to safeguard, key to safeguard uh, public health. Let me now say a few words uh, on the Cybercrime Convention, which becomes fundamental in the fight against the dramatic rise of number of cyber attacks and crimes committed in relations with the pandemic. Uh, the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, which provides consistent definitions of conducts to be criminalized, procedural powers for criminal justice authorities, and provisions to effectively cooperate internationally with a specific focus on the conditions and safeguards to be ensured when exercising procedural powers, the Budapest Convention, and namely in the recently, uh, uh, a month ago, adopted uh, second additional protocol, represents a global attempt at securing effective cybercrime investigations in full respect of the human rights and fundamental freedoms of individuals. And that is a crucial issue. In the majority of the member states, but also beyond the borders of the Council of Europe, since we're talking to an international audience, law enforcement authorities are already applying both conventions, Convention 108 and the Budapest Convention, and are reporting better results in preventing, investigating, prosecuting online criminal behavior, such as ransomware, fraud, denial of service attacks, grooming, phishing, ID theft, uh, election interference, which we have seen in over 70 countries in the world, and misuse and others. Now, in order to assist the parties to Convention 108 in addressing privacy and data protection issues when setting up and implementing measures in view of the light uh, of fights against the COVID-19 pandemic, two joint declarations were made by uh, the Council of Europe. And those joint declarations were by the chair of the Committee of Convention 108 and the Data Protection Commissioner of the organizations, of the organization, the Council of Europe. These declarations recall that general principles and rules of data protection 
are fully compatible and convergent with other fundamental rights and relevant public interests, such as public health. They stress that it is essential to ensure that data protection frameworks protect individuals and that the necessary privacy and data protection safeguards are to be incorporated in extraordinary schemes that are conceived to protect public health. A report that we published uh, some time ago on digital solutions to fight COVID-19, it was published in October 2020, deals with the issue of how personal data are processed in the 55 state parties of Convention 108 in relation to the pandemic. The, the report highlights commendable practices, but also less commendable practices, that have been followed by state parties, such as the use of privacy impact assessment and privacy by, pre, uh, by design principles in the shaping and implementation of digital solution to support public health measures. And those that needed to be improved or stopped, for example, the mandatory use of contact tracing applications for the whole population or measures taken in state of emergency without any time limits. The Committee of Convention 108 also issues, issued a statement on COVID-19 vaccination attestations and data protection, in which it acknowledges the usefulness of means such as vaccination passes that are considered or already developed by some states, as well as the legitimacy of people's wish to gain back some of the freedoms that were restricted due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the needs for the economy. Dear friends, the health relate, that health-related data are sensitive data. I don't need to explain that much more. They require additional guarantees when processed and no discrimination can be justified based on that. It is also suggested that alternatives to the use of such digital tools need to be made available to the population and that their use cannot be made mandatory. Finally, it should be underlined that when setting up databases for the monitoring of the organizational vaccination campaigns, strict respect to data protection principles and rules need to be, avert, uh, need to be observed. I will leave it at that, uh, dear moderator, and I'm, of course, ready to answer further questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Uh, now I will invite you to go to another uh, continent, namely in Africa, and to listen to Zanussi Dramer from the Gambia. Zanussi, uh, how the Gambian government uh, was dealing with the crisis? What, what were the measures that were that was uh, the, 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 the most important that they take and how it impacted human rights, namely the, the, the right to privacy and personal data, and how, what, which were the measures that you and your organization try uh, to put in place to mitigate the risks for individuals. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Um, good morning to uh, my colleagues. And good morning to all the other participants uh, in this uh, very important meeting. Um, first of all, um, when the COVID-19 uh, strike struck uh, in 2019, uh, the government of the Gambia was already in the process of uh, uh, developing what we call, no, prior to, yes, was already in the process of adopting uh, the data protection policy. Uh, however, at the time, there was no data protection uh, law in place, but the policy was uh, being uh, processed for it to be adopted. Policy came through uh, uh, the support of the Clasey Plus project of the Council of Europe, uh, which was also in line with uh, some of the provisions of uh, Convention 108 Plus. So that was one area that the government uh, 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 saw the need uh, for us to have a policy, a comprehensive policy that would address uh, 
uh, this particular issue. On the other hand, uh, the government of the Gambia uh, resorted uh, to, to use uh, other friendly all the online platforms uh, in order to mitigate the, the spread of COVID-19, uh, conduct meetings, especially uh, within uh, public officials. So we, we had these platforms that were um, the conferencing platforms that were used for meetings. And also uh, we used it for also uh, coordinating or managing projects and also uh, 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 staging uh, consultative and validation workshops. However, uh, this has led to uh, risk, various risks, uh, because uh, the protective mechanisms uh, were not properly uh, commissioned uh, to, to, to somehow mitigate the risk that comes with the use of technology uh, at that stage. So, um, Peter, do you have uh, another question or should I continue? Yes, please carry on. Could you, hello? Could, could, could you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you now. Okay, okay. No, no, I suggest that you, you're going forward. Yes. Okay, um, now um, going forward has uh, introduced uh, what we call the uh, COVID testing uh, platform, uh, whereby individuals uh, who want to get tested, their information, uh, personal information and sensitive information is uploaded on uh, those uh, information that those systems, and uh, it's also used for travel. I think this is very common in many many countries. But now the issue of the exposure of sensitive data is uh, because QR codes are being used uh, in order for uh, authorities to verify the information uh, regarding their uh, negative COVID tests or even positive COVID tests. So, but with the use of QR codes. Uh, you are challenged uh, because uh, encryption was not part of uh, the process. So without encryption of QR codes, uh, any uh, person who has access to the QR code can uh, see personal data, for example, uh, the date of birth uh, of an individual, uh, the, 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 even the test result itself. Uh, these are considered to be personal, uh, except for uh, uh, entities who are authorized to, to see it. So now, as a process, the government of the Gambia uh, wants to move forward and enact uh, what we call the personal the Gambia Data Protection and uh, Privacy Law. Uh, this was a bill, bill that was formulated uh, through the KLST Plus project that was supported by the Council of Europe. Uh, in 2020, uh, fourth quarter of 2020. As we speak right now, the bill has been submitted to the Ministry of Justice for review. Uh, it's been there for a while now, and we are expecting it to come out uh, hopefully uh, uh, early uh, next year. But the issue of contention here is uh, we have, as a government, we have uh, conducted study tours uh, within the region and have tried to incorporate uh, some particular practice from other countries such as Ghana, whereby the data protection authority is being merged uh, with the uh, right to information uh, authority. So now the balance is here. Uh, the right to information authority is to ensure that people have access to data and information uh, for their fundamental human rights. However, uh, does this balance uh, to uh, what is the balance uh, when you compare this to uh, the protection of uh, people's information and privacy? I know in the right to information or access to information uh, uh, act that we have in the Gambia has exceptions. 
for individual and personal data. Well, there could be instances where there could be a conflict if the same entity is, uh, is used uh, to give uh, some kind of uh, access to information to individuals or entities requesting, and uh, at the same time trying to protect uh, uh, access to uh, confidential uh, sensitive data of individuals or data subjects. So as a result, I have reached out to the Council of Europe uh, to see whether there could be support in doing a diagnostic before the government of the Gambia can adopt the Ghanaian model or to see whether our bill, uh, the data protection and privacy bill, and also the access to information uh, law, whether there are clashes, or whether there are conflicts, uh, which require us to, to, uh, to review everything. So these are some of the issues that are at hand. So um, uh, I think there's another point that I wanted to make sure of. Uh, now, when in trust, for example, now, people who are conversing, who are aware about data protection uh, issues, uh, if they know that their information that is being collected by authorities without any form of encryption, like the PPR code. How do they uh, gain trust of government that this information would not be uh, 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 put into the wrong hands? And of course, government needs to step up. We need to step up and address this matter with the Ministry of Health. And also the other issue is when we come to passports and biometric uh, identification cards, uh, the issue of data sovereignty comes into play, which is also fundamental to human rights. Uh, across the border data flows, uh, we do not have uh, laws that uh, go that regulate that as I, as I speak. However, the the law that we expect to be enacted will take care of that. But as we speak, we only have a policy that talks briefly on. Uh, transborder data. And also uh, the, the data protection law that we have is very minimal. It's very not very comprehensive. And it's part of what we call the Internet and Communication Act of 2009. That is law, but it's focusing more on the data that is collected by telecommunication operators. So it is not looking at other sectors like the banking sector and uh, other, other players within the the data processing and controlling uh, uh, domain. So these are some of the issues uh, which we think uh, we need to solve. As I speak, there is no study as I speak, not in Africa to say, African certain African countries might have a study regarding the impact of participation, uh, the increased participation uh, when it comes to the, the use of digital technology uh, that has been triggered by COVID, but it is apparent that in the Gambia and other many African countries that have been the case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanusi. Thank you. These are very important issues. I invite you to jump to yet, to yet another continent, and namely to the US. And I invite the most bravest uh, of our speakers, Hannah Meyer, to take the floor. Hannah, is it 3 uh, 30 at your place? I, 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 I believe it's, <laughs> it's, it's a really commendable. Uh, thank that you joined the panel. Thank you very much for that. We are reading really great news from the US um, in terms of the vaccination of the population. But what about civil liberties, uh, human rights, privacy, data protection? What, what have you come across during, during the last two years, um, I, I could say? Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Peter. And it's a pleasure to join everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Hannah Mayer, and I'm an attorney advisor at the U.S. Department of Justice in the Office of Privacy and Civil Liberties. And so my office is responsible for protecting the privacy and civil liberties of individuals through review, oversight, and coordination of the department's privacy program, and for advising department leadership on the privacy implications of legislative and regulatory proposals. Um, at my office, I also support the duties and responsibilities of the department's chief privacy and civil liberties officer who advises the attorney general, as well as provide legal advice and guidance to the department and its components on privacy, legal and policy matters. So 
I will primarily be speaking to what the Department of Justice has been doing at the federal level within the United States. Um, and just for some context setting, there are over 42 components at the Department of Justice, including the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration, as well as our litigating components, such as the Criminal and Civil Division. So we have over 165,000 employees, as well as contractors or task officers. There are also visitors that we have. And during the pandemic, DOJ has really taken an advisory role given the stature of Department of Justice to provide legal guidance and advice to the executive branch. And so uh, our office really was working with the department and taking a lead in advising and navigating the pandemic to be able to approach these issues and to ensure that we are we are meeting that correct balance between health and safety, as well as the protection of personal information. So in the United States, we have a different uh, type of legal framework. So uh, we have a sectoral approach to federal privacy. We also have privacy enshrined in our constitution that is further opined on by our courts uh, throughout the, the federal system, as well as at the state level. And so what we really have today, what I want to focus on is looking at the framework we have on the books and then how we have implement, implemented that at the Department of Justice during COVID-19. Um, so really just uh, starting with our, our Supreme Court case that is still good precedent, Jacobson v. Massachusetts. Um, it's an interesting case in the United States. Uh, it's dealing with uh, a group of anti-vaccinators who uh, were led by a man with the last name of Jacobson. Uh, he refused to get uh, a vaccine that was required by a Massachusetts statute. And as a result, uh, he was charged. There was a criminal trial. Uh, he then was found guilty. It was appealed from the trial court and ultimately ended up in our Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court, this case, uh, was decided in 1905, so over 116 years ago. However, it's still good precedent and really is still the, the law of the land, uh, so to speak, when the federal government is approaching vaccines. Ultimately, the court found that the statute in question uh, related to health law and it was exercised and enacted in a reasonable uh, manner, reasonable and proper manner uh, of the police power of the state. And in Justice Harlan's opinion, he, he noted that under certain circumstances, the police power of a state may be exerted in such an arbitrary and oppressive manner as to justify the interference of the courts to prevent wrong and oppression. However, this was not one of those cases. And so again, getting to that issue of what is the appropriate amount of police power to be able to protect health and safety versus balancing the individual rights to uh, make their own decisions as well as information. Um, ultimately, in that case, uh, Jacobson was, uh, the Supreme Court upheld the decision of the trial court and he had to pay a fine of $5, which was uh, what the statute required. So that is the precedent we have in addition to the sectoral laws that we also have within the United States. Um, there are many of them that deal with personal information and really depend on the context in which you're in. Um, so looking at the institutional response, um, specifically at the department, um, as we kind of went through the pandemic, really pre-vaccination, it was a general handling of personal information, such as medical information of employees and contractors. Uh, most individuals were teleworking, um, so there really wasn't uh, a need for the creation of any type of, of system necessarily. Um, and uh, we weren't conducting contact tracing by QR codes. We, there, were, there were no systems set up because um, there really wasn't a need for that. Um, so there really wasn't any uh, substantial conflict. Um, it was generally just applying what our structure had, had been. And then following the Food and Drug Administration, approval of vaccinations in the United States, the Biden administration issued two executive orders, which in the United States do have the force of law. So again, adding to our regulatory and legal framework, uh, the first executive order directed collection of data about vaccination status uh, for employees, as well as directed a, a task force on how to handle information on contractors for the United States government. 
And then the second executive order required the vaccination of all federal employees with exceptions for medical and religious accommodations. Now, in order to to collect this type of information, there was a requirement and a need to build out an information system that everyone could actually input this type of information as well as their vaccination status. This included a photo of the vaccine card. In addition, it also included any requests for these medical or religious accommodations. And so getting to the question of, you know, how do you build out a system and do it in a way that is balancing both the individual rights uh, related to individual information and the privacy interests associated, um, but also with the health and safety of individuals and the general public. So for for the DOJ and for the federal government in general, we have privacy laws in place that apply to the collection of personal information about individuals already. So that framework was already there. Under the Privacy Act of 1974 in the United States, there are specific legal obligations about how to uh, protect information as well as uh, the notices that we're obligated to provide to the public about the type of information we're collecting. Uh, the DOJ already had a system of record notice, had this notice in place for public health emergencies. So um, for from a compliance perspective, the notice was already provided there. Also, um, we, when looking at the system, had to conduct a privacy impact assessment. This is also a, a already established legal requirement in the United States for the collection of personal information by information technologies. So our office worked with the department to go through and analyze what type of information was being collected, how it was being protected, what the risks to the information were, and how we were mitigating that as a department. There was also um, the need to conduct forms, which also have legal requirements um, from a privacy perspective that attach, especially for uh, requesting medical and religious accommodations um, under the First Amendment, freedom of religion in the United States. Uh, there's special statutory authority required to collect religious information without consent. So also analyzing uh, what the implications there were and how to best protect that information and ensure that we were in line with law. So. In addition to our compliance obligations that we were working with the department in order to stand up this system, we really were building the system with privacy by design principles in mind. So we were at the table with the developers looking at the type of system and portal that we could develop at the department to ensure that we were building trust ensuring that individuals had access, could input their information in an accessible way, but then also only collecting information that we needed, not collecting more than was authorized, and really applying the security controls as well as the privacy controls from the ground up. In addition, also considering the type of information that we were collecting, for example, the religious and medical accommodations and uh, working towards building a system that really was baking in privacy from the beginning. And ultimately we found that this was a very successful process. And at the department, we have um, over 99% of the department um, attested to the requirements of the executive orders, which implies just by numbers that, you know, there, there was trust built into that system, individuals were providing their information, and ultimately we have been able to use that information to show that over 90% of full-time full employees have been vaccinated um, and also break down the further percentages of the accommodations just so that we can meet our um, regulatory obligations, but then also, um, you know, ensure that we are building systems that promote trust and that also are protected from a security and privacy perspective as well. So I will end there. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. That's very thorough and 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 and, and complex, I must say, but uh, very interesting. Thank you, Hannah. And as my little daughter is saying, if you start jumping, let's let's never stop. So let's jump yet again to another continent. And I'm turning to uh, Schwenke. You are based in New Delhi, but you also work a lot with UN agencies uh, as a consultant. So, uh, and, and if I if I understood correctly, you are in the intersection of open data, 
um, uh, uh, protection of, of individuals, how, how to best use data, uh, what have been your experiences? What have you seen during the pandemic? How how governments uh, or international organizations could use uh, the researches that you've been carrying carrying out? Thank you, Shonka. This is your turn. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation, Peter. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the um, participants. Yes, it's correct. I'm a consultant for UNESCO, and um, Recently, I have drafted guidelines for the member states on open data and then particularly on open data for AI systems. So open data are data that can be freely used, modified and shared by anyone for any purpose, including by AI systems. In other words, um, the data should be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. These are the so-called FAIR principles. And this is motivated by the fact that open data are considered as a prerequisite for, for informed plans, decisions, and interventions, especially related to the SDGs, but now most recently also related to COVID-19. So I thought it would be a good idea to um, make a case study to what extent open data were used uh, during the pandemic. And um, so I'm, I'm talking about the outcome of this case study now. Um, to tackle um, the COVID-19 pandemic from the onset, timely, relevant, and quality data were essential. But it became also clear that in addition to these features, also openness of data was critical. And, that, um, and indeed, a large amount of open data related to COVID-19 were shared and had significant impact. And then again, a distinction has to be made whether the data are harnessed by humans or um, to fuel AI systems. Just a few examples. Um, already in January 2022, scientists had issued a letter and called for open um, sharing of um, um, the, the um, COVID-19 data. Then in March 2020, the UNESCO and Director General advocated for scientific cooperation and the integration of um, open science in their research programs. And then in in the, in the following month, April 2020, the Open, uh, Open COVID pledge was launched, which calls on organizations around the world to make their patents and copyrights freely available, which, um, and this um, pledge uh, received many signatories, including from major corporations. Also, so also the private sector was involved. And indeed then, what followed in the following month, um, and, and uh, almost now um, two years, um, open data as well as uh, AI systems were used successfully for diagnosis, prognostication, containment and monitoring, drug and vaccine um, development and treatments, as well as forecasting during the pandemic. Just one example, but out of many a particularly successful uh, data-driven AI model has been developed um, for the city of Valencia in Spain by a team of researchers. This model um, predicts um, COVID-19 infection rates and prescribes um, non-pharmaceutical intervention plans um, and contributes to more evidence-driven policy making. But this is just one example. There have been plenty of examples around the globe where open data um, were applied um, successfully during the pandemic. Um, but as you can imagine, despite the large number of open data initiatives related to COVID-19, and also their timeliness, there were remaining um, challenges. There were um, overall significant data gaps, especially in um, developing countries and among um, at-risk populations. Also, there were issues with um, data of poor quality and um, lacking data disaggregation, especially disaggregation by sex, which is, would be um, very much desirable that this um, would, be, would be fixed. And, um, what are the reasons for these challenges? Um, among other things, it's um, there are funding gaps, um, especially in low income and um, lower middle income countries. Um, these uh, these countries were facing significant financial um, challenges to um, related to coming up with COVID nineteen data and statistics. And also overall, um, the data which were used during the um, pandemic often did not fulfill the FAIR principles which I introduced before, so they were not um, entirely findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And another challenge, um, and this is also very much related to this, this panel, um, is that um, 
open data um, is, the is to keep the balance between open COVID-19 data and the right to privacy. For instance, there have been um, instances of leaked data of um, COVID-19 patients, which was an, an issue. Another issue is um, that, especially during this pandemic, but also that the phenomenon came up before, um, that the pandemic is accompanied by disinformation and misinformation. And um, this has been dubbed by UNESCO as disinfodemic. So this was, this was a major issue and this is still ongoing, unfortunately. So overall, the um, COVID-19 pandemic has brought the world together to address um, this global challenge. So um, there were significant breakthroughs um, made owing to timely open data exchange and collaboration and um, forecasting and diagnostic tools, as well as um, vaccines were provided in record time. However, um, it has to be also noted that most of these open data initiatives were ad hoc and not well um, coordinated because the world was um, obviously not um, well prepared for the pandemic. So as a lesson learned, um, there have to be regularly rec um, regu regulatory um, frameworks and data governance models um, should be developed, supported by sufficient infrastructure, human resources, funding, and institutional capabil capabilities to address the challenges um, related to open data and to be um, better prepared for similar um, situation in the future. And again, related to AI, also the relationship between um, open data and AI um, needs to be further specified, including um, what features are required so that um, data are truly AI ready. Very briefly, I um, talk about now also in general, not related now to the pandemic, but in general um, about issues of um, open data. So what are the pros and cons? Um, there are quite a few um, pros related to open data. It is argued in favor of open data that there cannot be um, a copyright actually on factual data anyway, and that um, everyone should have the right to access um, data. It is um, considered as a feature of um, democracy that activities of governments um, are transparent through open data. And there have been many um, success stories in previous years, also before the um, pandemic. And in addition to accessing the data, the opportunity to reuse, rearrange, and combine them and potentially gain new scientific insights from them enables actually citizens' engagement, which is um, important and also creates um, new innovative services and products. So um, it, open data could increase social and um, commercial or could lead to social and commercial value. And um, obviously there are, there are um, opponents of open data or there, there are arguments against it. And um, one point is again, um, that the data may violate the privacy of concerned um, individuals whose right um, it is to control um, what is actively or passively collected about them and, um, and what is um, disclosed about um, th those individuals. And then also um, in many cases, um, the collection, cleaning and dissemination of data is, is both um, labor and cost um, intensive. And this may um, deserve financial compensation, but this uh, financial compensation would be omitted if the data are openly shared, although some, some work and cost has had been invested in the data before. Um, another point is that um, data can be misused um, uh, with um, malicious intentions. And um, there again, um, AI um, would be one, um, one issue that um, AI systems may um, misuse them because AI systems are of dual use that in this uh, regard, there's this term of data hazard. So in summary, um, the protection of individuals' personal data, especially at times of crisis is a significant concern. Many valuable uh, government data are about citizens. So therefore um, the balance between releasing this data and the privacy of the um, citizens is an ongoing debate and especially um, related to, to AI. Um, because the, if AI um, systems are considered, there are further challenges such as um, bias and discrimination, but also potential malicious acts. So um, yeah, in a nutshell, there have been um, quite a few um, 
benefits by opening the data. And um, I talked about those success stories, but um, we must not um, forget or keep in mind um, the challenges, especially related to privacy. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Shwanka. It was very, very interesting indeed. Um, I'm turning to Rachel. Hello, Rachel. I'm very happy uh, that you are here with us. You are representing UNESCO. And, and you told me that UNESCO uh, put out a few propositions for using guidelines for traditional actors, how freedom of expression has to be respected. But they also promoted a number of safeguards in relation to surveillance measure. C could you give us a, a more in depth? Um, uh, view um, and, 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 and explanation on, on those measures. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, th thank you so much, Peter. Um, so my, my name is Rachel Pollack. I work in the section for freedom of expression and safety of journalists at UNESCO. Uh, we uh, have a mandate to promote freedom of expression and its corollaries of access to information and press freedom. Um, so I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 on these issues. Um, we've heard a lot about privacy today, um, but there have also been major impacts on freedom of expression. Um, I'd like to also thank Peter for inviting us to co-organize this open forum. Uh, we've been strong partners for many years and, uh, and are really happy to, to join in, in this effort. Um, I think when, when we proposed this session, um, it was a little bit too optimistic because it was on regulation in the post-COVID world. And I think, unfortunately, we see that this is uh, we're not yet there. Um, and I hope that uh, next year we, we will be able to meet in person again. Um, and it's really nice to see a lot of familiar faces in the, in the Zoom chat. Um, so just to give a little bit of, of context um, on the impact of COVID on freedom of expression, Many uh, governments declared states of emergency, uh, particularly last year. Some of them were extended uh, for quite long periods um, that had impacts on fundamental rights, uh, including freedom of expression. Uh, to give some numbers, um, according to the International Press Institute, between February 2020 and May 2021, Journalists covering COVID-19 across the world were affected by more than 100 restrictions on access to information, 215 arrests or charges, 95 cases of censorship, and 238 verbal or physical attacks. Um, the restrictions on freedom of movement also hindered the work of journalists. Um, the former UN Special Rapporteur David Kay had a report in April 2020 in which he noted that while temporary constraints on freedom of movement are essential to beating COVID-19, they must never be used as a pretext for cracking down on journalists' ability to do their work. Uh, we also saw during this period an increase uh, in laws meant to, to fight disinformation or so-called fake news. Um, as our last speaker mentioned, there, there was uh, this wave of disinformation and misinformation that UNESCO has called the, a disinfodemic. Um, like the, the infodemic or pandemic with the free UNESCO, it's a disinfodemic. Um, but in response to that, we saw a number of regulatory measures um, that infringed on that were overly broad, um, did not have the kind of necessary limits um, in, for restrictions on freedom of expression. Um, and we observed that in the last few years, there have been uh, at least 57 laws across 44 countries uh, that have been adopted that risk infringing freedom of expression online. Um, and, and this data will be included in a forthcoming publication uh, we have on world trends and freedom of expression and media development. Um, so in response, in, in this context, and in response to the growing legal challenges, uh, UNESCO has issued a number of guidelines and resources. These include uh, guidelines for judges and other judicial actors uh, at national and regional level. Um, there's a set of guidelines specifically um, within the context of emergencies and, and COVID-19 uh, that was developed together with uh, the University of Oxford and a series of massive open online courses. Uh, we also have uh, we worked with uh, Mila, which is uh, the Quebec Institute for Artificial Intelligence, to develop and deploy uh, an open source peer-to-peer -peer solution to contact tracing apps, um, which we've we've heard about this morning. Um, we also have issued uh, some publications, policy briefs. Uh, we had one early in the pandemic called 
journalism, press freedom, and COVID-19 that outlines some of the challenges uh, to media freedom and, and journalism. Um, and we also put out a brief on the right to information in times of crisis. And that has a, a number of recommendations and uh, including that states have a positive op obligation to disclose on a proactive basis, emergency related health, budgetary policy making and procurement information. Um, we also saw and this brief talks about that there are some logistical barriers uh, and processing requests information. Um, but that the, the states do have a, a duty to, to provide this information on it in a timely basis. Um, I think we, again, there was a lot of discussion today about, about um, contact tracing, but I think we also have to keep in mind that the measures instituted during COVID uh, are not unique to the public health context. And in fact, um, all of the, the devices that we that we use, um, especially from the social media platforms and others, um, also engage in this kind of surveillance um, and what, what has been dubbed uh, a surveillance capitalism, uh, for example, that has a major impact, of course, on, on people's right to privacy, um, but also on, on freedom of expression. Um, the issue of surveillance is something that is increasingly on UNESCO's radar. Um, this will be the topic of World Press Freedom Day 2022, which will take place in Uruguay and under the theme uh, journalism under surveillance. Um, and we actually have just released yesterday uh, a call for proposals um, to, to take part in that conference, which, which I encourage you uh, to take a look at. Um, and I'd like to end just uh, mentioning, I think, uh, for all of these measures for protecting freedom of expression, um, having better access to information and in the context of COVID and more generally, um, UNESCO advocates strongly for greater transparency um, related to digital technologies and, and especially to the operations of the big internet companies. Um, we put out a, a brief last spring um, called Letting the Sun Shine In, uh, transparency and accountability in the digital age, um, which includes 26 high level principles on transparency, including uh, several related to data protection and privacy. So I think we, we have to be very vigilant about that um, and the practices that have been put in place during COVID and afterwards, but again, thinking about that in a, in a larger context. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. That's terrific. And thank you very much. I, uh, the privacy and freedom of expression are sister and brothers, right? So one cannot exist without the other. So it's, it's very pertinent as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we have seven minutes left. I, I haven't seen any questions in the on the chat, but if you have any, this is really the time. Uh, but while, while, while waiting for the audience, um, I will turn to the panelists with one uh, quick, uh, one, one, uh, one question. Uh, answering you to um, requesting you to kindly answer this in one minute. So I'm turning to Sanusi first because you you mentioned the role of data protection law, uh, which, which could play and how strategic is in your country um, uh, determination. So it's, I, I, I would like to ask you the, the following because during the pandemic, personal data have been exposed uh, in many countries. But how do you think that an enforceable legal framework, including a comprehensive law on data protection, could have avoided data breaches or better protect individuals? So one minute, Sanusi, if you don't mind. Um, yes, that's a very important question. Um, and first, uh, it, will help, it will create accountability uh, because data protection uh, uh, law bill has a provision for accountability to hold data pro, uh, processors and controllers to account in order to ensure that they meet, so that they put certain safeguards in place. Um, so that would really help a lot. And also um, uh, uh, human rights by design, let's say applications or uh, uh, information systems or tools or mechanisms uh, that data processors and uh, operators use, uh, they have to ma make sure that it meets certain requirements. So the law would cater in for that, and the regulatory enforcement would uh, ensure compliance. Thank you. Thank you very much. 40, 
45 seconds. Very good. Thank you so much. I'm turning back to Rachel. Rachel, um, we talked about that this is the first time that the, in the area of digitalization that we experienced uh, such a pandemic and, and with such a dimension. What do you think have been the main mistakes made by government uh, when taking temporary regulatory measures? So have they been any? Uh, what could have been done differently to guarantee not only public health, but at the same time to guarantee that only the necessary minimum interference with human rights is done and to guarantee the protection of individuals uh, with respect to the right to privacy and freedom of expression. Rachel? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, this, this is a, not an easy question or an easy three questions, I would say, to answer. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of discussion about how to develop technologies <clears throat> that were the least invasive possible from the perspective of privacy. So, um, for example, using uh, Bluetooth and the application that UNESCO developed with Mila in Quebec, I, I think, is an example of that. Um, so there are ways to uh, bake it in already at the design stage, um, privacy by design. I think, um, you know, just to, to go back to my remarks earlier, uh, I, I think the mistakes could be could be seen as using the pandemic as an excuse to institute restrictions. Um, that were not necessary. And, and one could think very cynically, you know, that, that it was just opportunistic um, beyond what was really necessary. Um, and I think we saw that, especially in crackdowns on, uh, on freedom of expression, on journalists. Um, I think uh, the issues related to access to information and um, what information commissions were able to provide, um, in many cases, they were simply overwhelmed. Um, and so I, I don't think that there was bad will then, but I, it shows that in the future, um, more capacity is needed. How are you? Yes. Oh, hello. <laughs> I think we have another secret. Um, I think that, that means it's time for time for someone else to, to come in on the question. So we only have three minutes left. But anyway, um, very, very interesting questions and uh, look forward to, to hearing what others have to say in the, the, um, in the last two minutes. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Turning to Schwenke. Um, Shwanki, you, you, you spoke about the engage, engagement with, um, with um, uh, multinational private companies. So can you comment on a concrete example, whether either public or private organization has decided to apply open data and what has been its effect on human rights? I mean, more concretely, and in one minute, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yes, there were quite a few examples. and um, But then again... Um, Many of the relevant data held by uh, corporations were, in, in this case, when it comes to COVID-19, not, not related to human rights because um, those uh, the, the corporations, they held also um, data about the, the, the their development of, of um, pharmaceuticals, of, of um, medication, of vaccines. So um, these data, of course, um, this, this um, was very much desirable to be shared. and. There were cases when it happened, and this is not um, necessarily related to human rights. When it comes to human rights, of course, um, this related, uh, would be da data when the um, corporations did any tests um, with humans, when they tested the vaccines with humans. Um, there, the balance was more relevant, but I think the, the data I talked first about, um, they, are, they were more critical um, in the beginning, and um, it was desirable that they were shared, and there were a few instances, and I think in, in this case, um, this was... Um, there were no issues to human rights, so this was appreciated when they were shared and there were examples. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hannah, you, you mentioned in, 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 in your speech that um, regulating COVID and, and privacy-related measures, but also in more broadly civil liberties and, 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 um, and human rights uh, must rely on trust. How do you think authorities can build trust among citizens? How citizens can be confident that their personal data will be protected uh, after all? So I Thank think you. this is this is the under the underlying issue of privacy always. So not just in the pandemic context. So really ensuring that uh, governments are doing what they say they're doing, and also understanding how systems are operating. And so really, I do think. Um, 
understanding technology as a privacy professional, as a privacy attorney is understanding technology, understanding data and understanding how uh, to balance both your mission, but also to protect the individual interests in that information. And so, uh, you know, ensuring that there aren't just um, the, the minimization of collection um, or just limiting to uh, the collection of information for the purposes for which you need them, but then also on the security side, protecting them. So I, I do think the relationship between privacy and security is, is definitely the crux of where the trust underlies and it's where we see the data breaches. And those are really um, where there's a lot of mistrust and distrust that is, is usually where the public um, starts asking questions. So I think it's working as a team to, to build privacy in with the technologists is absolutely key to continue to build trust uh, with systems, especially with sensitive information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really like that. Turning to Patrick, Patrick, as, as, as the last speaker, you, 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 in your speech, you talked about uh, measures about consular fear of uh, uh, put in place, but are really people aware and conscious about what temporary measures mean for their human rights, specifically private life and data protection. What could be done by an organization such as the Council of Europe to raise consciousness of awareness about the subject and avoiding disinformation of citizens? Patrick, in one minute, if you yeah, can, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Peter. I think rather than trying to stumble over my words in those 30 seconds that I've got left, I think it's um, more important for me to, to thank all participants on, on behalf of the Council of Europe for having accepted to take part in this wonderful panel. Uh, Peter, Sanusi, Hannah, Sunke, um, uh, Rachel, Anna, thank you for waking up in the middle of the night just to uh, uh, speak to us. My full admiration to you and my full admiration to the colleagues from all over the world for having participated in this panel. And I, I think, uh, Peter, we, I would need to send the, the question back to you and to all of the participants, yes, in theory, we can do things, but it's also how do we as individual react when, uh, for example, you're invited to, to uh, um, access an application. The question is then, will you do it or not? And I think it's also a question of um, what is the utility for, for yourself? And then sometimes we put our principles to the side. And even if we're reluctant to do so, we will still do so. So thank you very much for, for this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you indeed uh, to, to all of you. I will abuse my role of moderator a little bit and uh, reply to your question, Patrick, in 30 minutes. I think to raise awareness, IGF is a wonderful uh, initiative. I think we have uh, contributed to the awareness raising of the issues at stake. You have been wonderful, really good. Thank you very much for all your comments, input. I think there is a lot of information here, a lot of food for thought. Uh, please carry on, uh, share information, work together, build trust, and safeguard human rights, uh, rule of law, and democracies. Thank you so much, and have a good day. Thank and you. Have a, have a good sleep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you thank very you. much. Bye-bye. Thank you.